Okay, so let's get started. So because we are starting so late, um, let me introduce Julian Charles uh, Christou from Noir Lab and Gemini, who will be talking about the impact and mitigation of satellite constellations on astronomical laser guide star propagation. And because he's so late back, he has 30 seconds. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, he'll have 15 minutes. It's okay. <laughs> but it will seem a lot longer. <clears throat> <laughs> So anyway, um, so I'm going to change the topic a bit because um, a lot of the talk so far have been about contamination of either uh, optical or radio observing from the, from the uh, SATCOMs. I'm going to talk about what happens when the SATCOMs don't let you observe. Okay, so um, there we go. So I'm sure uh, I, I work in a field called ad adaptive optics and we use laser guide stars. And laser guide stars we use for, as a reference to take out the turbulence of the atmosphere. Um, you could say we take, we take the twinkling out of starlight, okay, so we can get resolution equivalent to that from, uh, as you would from a space telescope. And lasers are one of the methods in which we do that. However, there are some overheads associated with that. So here's an outline of the talk. I'll briefly to introduce what a laser guide star is. What laser deconfliction is, that's something very unique to the US community and only the US community. Um, our interaction with the satellite constellations of using laser guide stars. What the laser clearing house is, I, um, you'll have to wait for that one. And then where do we go from there, which is what mitigation strategies do we have in place or we are working towards to hopefully um, get out from uh, uh, not being able to, to observe or to do some observing. Okay, so uh, as I said, adaptive optics gives us ground-based diffraction li limited observations. And it's been around for a while. Um, quite often, it started out by using a natural guide star. A natural guide star, in other words, you look at, you, you just look at a bright star, you use that as a reference to, uh, to calibrate the atmosphere for. Um, it's called wavefront sensing, you measure the wavefront, you take out that ray, uh, and you, you take out the inverse of that wavefront, send it to a deformable piece of optics, a uh, deformable mirror, and, and you flatten the wavefront, and then you've got diffraction limit, limit. It's as simple as that, in theory. In practice, obviously, it's a lot, lot more difficult. Um, natural guide stars, um, bright enough or few and far between, gives you very limited sky coverage. So the solution was to generate an artificial guide star. Um, now, to go back in history here, the first actually actual usable adaptive optic systems were generated by the US military, by the um, US Air Force, in fact. Um, and they also developed the, the initial technology for laser guide stars of creating an artificial reference source. And uh, if you look at this image here, that's an image of a satellite you know, which is our nemesis here. But that's an image of a satellite, which, we, which I actually took a number of years ago in a large eight meter telescope. Um, it's an H-band image. That is, that's actually a diffraction limited image. But that's an example of why the US Air Force were very interested in developing adaptive optics. So they could actually look at these satellites and see what they were, friend or foe or whatever. Um, however, uh, you know, th there's a little bit of history down there, um, you know, uh, when the, the Department of, U.S. Department of Defense declassified a lot of the technology around about 1990. At the same time, astronomy, ast astronomers, both in Europe and the United States, were ramping up their own versions of, of adaptive optics and started to come up with their own laser guide star technology. Um, and there are basically two types of laser guide stars, and that's basically all you need to know. Rayleigh beacons, which project uh, an artificial star at a range of 15 kilometers, and a sodium guide star, which is at an altitude of about 90 to 100 kilometers. Um, and the benefits, of, of, as I said, of creating an artificial guide star is that you can pretty much place it anywhere you want in the sky, and it significantly increases your sky coverage. And, and here's the nice picture gallery, laser guide stars around the world, okay? So I won't spend a lot of time on that, just get, get some idea. The different colors are actually representative of the different types of lasers. So the yellow, the yellow ones are sodium lasers. You know, they're, they're in the sodium D line, why not? Uh, the, green one, the green one is a, uh, a 532 nanometer um, 
laser used for, uh, uh, used for um, uh, uh, a Rayleigh beacon. And this one over here, the Robo AO, is actually an ultraviolet laser, which we can't see with that eye, but fortunately, phone cameras can see it. Now, laser deconfliction, what is laser deconfliction? This is, this is our bugbear. This is what we have to deal with. Um, basically, the bottom line is that US-operated and US-based astronomical LGS propagation, uh, observatory propagation, are required by the National Science Foundation, who, who is the basic funding agency behind them, to follow <coughs> Department of Defense laser deconfliction. And laser deconfliction is defined in two documents which come out of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in the, in the US military. Um, and I've given you the references there. I don't, you know, um, when, you can, when these slides are available, you can look them up and see exactly what they mean. But basically, the bottom line is that, um, uh, is that satellites are protected from inadvertent illumination. Okay. So the, 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 idea that, the idea behind it is that if you're propagating a laser, we don't say shooting a laser because that implies warfare, okay? We're propagating a laser because we're not, we're not actually shooting anything down. So we propagate it, but if it goes within, or if a, I should rephrase that, if a satellite comes within, let's say, a cone of about half a degree, maybe a quarter of a degree, depending on various circumstances, um, we have to shutter the laser. That's laser deconfliction. That's how it affects us. So every time a satellite goes nearby the target of interest we're, we're, we're looking at, we have to shutter the laser. And then we have to open it again. Now, now that shuttering time can be milliseconds. It can be seconds. It depends. Um, but often it's very, it's very quick, especially for low Earth orbit, low, low Earth orbit satellite. Um, but the recovery time to recover the adaptive optics and get the system going can be five to 10 minutes. So, you know, the laser shuttering time is nothing, but the, the impact on observing is a lot. So, um, now the laser clearinghouse is responsible for implementing this DOD laser deconfliction policy. And it ensures, I mean, this is basically you know, a definition of, of what it's about. Um, it ensures laser activities are conducted in a safe and res responsible manner to protect space systems, you know, it's not to make us more efficient, it's to protect space systems. That's, that's the key point, at least in the, in the current definition. Uh, and US astronomical observatories following the, uh, the, the, uh, have been following this protocol thanks to the NSF mandate since the early 2000s when we first started propagating lasers. DOD systems have go back to the 1980s when they first started using it, and that's when it first became an issue. Um, Non-US, and non-US based observatories are not required to follow this protocol. So ESO lasers, any lasers in operation on top of um, uh, ORM do not. You know, I mean, Durham have been out there. Uh, Domenico Bonaccini from ESO has been out there testing lasers. They don't have to worry about satellites whatsoever. Aircraft, yes, satellites, no. So it's only the US community which is affected by this. Um, and, that, and that's an issue in and of itself, which I will come to. Um, and then there was an impact study done in 2010 by the Institute of Defense Analysis, not the International Dark Sky Association, it's two different IDAs, um, saying that laser deconfliction, you know, did have a cost, but that cost was really very minimal compared to other downtime of adaptive optics and laser systems. So it's something we could live with. So in 2010, there were not many, not many laser operators out there for in the US community, and there were not many satellites up there either. 10 years later, the whole situation has changed. We found a 2020 study by the Jasons. The Jasons are basically uh, a think tank which give advice to various US government agencies, um, pointed out the risks of SATCOMs in that, in that if the laser deconfliction policy is still followed, it would in increase the closure win number of closure windows by, uh, 100, by a factor of 100. Okay, that's significant. And I will talk, you know, come to that in a bit more detail. Um, and in fact, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna show you a plot of closures for four different observatories. 
um, four different telescopes, I should say. Um, and it's a historical list going back to the first laser propagation. Uh, and basically saying, you know, the, the amount of observation time loss varies from observ observatory to observatory. So we don't, we're not concerned about the amount of time lost in these plots, I'm going to show you, as we are in that the trends are all basically the same between the four telescopes. Um, and you will see that when we get to May 2019, the first Starlink launch, and afterwards there, there's a, a ramped increase in the number of closures. And then about a year ago, um, there was an agreement made with Starlink, who basically, um, and this took a lot of work, a lot of effort, and a lot of communication, and a lot of goodwill, on behalf of our community, on behalf of the, uh, the Starlink and SpaceX, on behalf of the National Science Foundation, um, to basically uh, say, say that you know, our lasers are not a threat to them, so they, they opted out, they waived the protection of the Department of Defense. So, so there, there, there are four, four plots, Gemini South, Lake Observatory, the Gemini South is in Chile. Lake Observatory is right outside of San Jose in California. Uh, Kek 1 and Kek 2 are both on Mauna Kea on the Big Island of Hawaii. And basically, you can see, you know, this is going from 2012 up to um, the end of last year, the beginning of this year. And this first dashed line is, is the, the first Starlink launch. And before that, there was a slight increase because the number of satellites was increasing. But then, as you can see, the number of closure windows began to take off. You see the big gap here, thanks to COVID. Um, so a, lot of, a lot of history in one plot. And this blue line here is where the waiver agreement uh, took place between us and the National Science Foundation and, and Starlink. And I, I will admit, Starlink have, have been working very nicely with us on doing this. So, you know, and after that, the number of closure windows have dropped. I'm sorry, I don't have a more up-to-date plot. Um, I wasn't able to get the data in time for the meeting. But the bottom line is that um, you, know, you, know, you might think, well, that's all well and good. That's fine. You know, you've got it now solved because Starlink have opted out. But Starlink are not the only players in the game, are they? We know they're not. And we also know that we have hundreds of thousands of satellites, you know, um, communication satellites, which are on the books, which may or may not be launched, but they're actually being filed with the FCC. And um, so that's something for us to worry about. Uh, the agreement we have with, with Starlink, which has also recently been um, followed up on with OneWeb, and hopefully shortly with Amazon Kuiper, is that they too will, will, will opt out of the laser clearinghouse um, protection. However, that's up, to the, that's up to the satellite companies. It's basically their goodwill, which basically is, uh, which we're depending on. And we'd like something more concrete than that. Now, to give you some example, this is, uh, putting out the wrong thing. Um, this is based on some uh, data from Teresa Jones at um, uh, SIA, um, so Satellite Industry Asso uh, Associates. Um, who, and these are the four telescopes. These are, this is average closures per night. Um, now, if we take you know, what's projected over, over the next um, N years, at least 162,000 satellites, you know, certain telescopes will have large, a total loss, 98%, 50%, 50% closures, if nothing is done. Now, this does not, in, this does not take into account the Starlink waiver. Two minutes. Um, hmm? Two minutes. Okay. Non-US satellites non-U.S. satellites um, and or companies not necessarily operating within U.S. Um, uh, uh, restrictions is around about 130,000. So that's still a significant amount of on-sky time which is lost. And um, if we just pull out the Chinese ones, which we think are going to be launched by the end of this decade, from what we understand, there's about 15,000. It's, you know, it's a smaller amount. And this is probably somewhat more realistic than this one. It depends on which, um, which satellites actually get launched. So I talked about the waiver. Um, that should read 2022, not 2020. So there's a typo, typo there. Um, 
This is approved by the USSF, and it was implemented December 22nd, that, uh, uh, d December 2022, last year. And it's all followed on this NSF coordination agreement between the federal government and now the satellite companies. Um, and there's a link here which you can find to the NSF site, which actually explains what that coordination agreement is. Um, and that waiver is part of a coordination agreement. So any satellite company working within our domain is going to be, um, is going to be you know, will hopefully waive. Uh, now, this April, we had a meeting at Vandenberg Space, Space Force Base um, between all the interested parties. And this is a list of who they were. And in the interest of time, I will just skip this one and get to the, get to the meet. Basically, the Laser Clearinghouse waiver requires voluntary participation from the satellite companies. Um, we inquired, could we do an opt-in? What the Laser Clearinghouse does is they collect all the satellite data from all across the world. They know where everything is, close, near enough, and they, so they, can, they know that you know, if we're gonna be pointing in the direction of some satellite, they know that, um, you know, that we should be blocked or, or anybody dealing with them needs to be blocked. Um, so, and, and it's a default situation, so we inquired, is there an opt-in procedure could, you know, where, where a satellite company could be, by default, left out and then added in if they required protection? We were told, no, there's no such, um, no, no such uh, way of doing that. Satellite design modification so that our lasers do not impact um, the satellite. The, we're not talking about shooting down satellites. We're talking about maybe um, temporarily blinding or causing some damage to a sensor, okay? This, our lasers are not powerful. There are other lasers out there which are, but ours are not, okay? And right now we are in this third category uh, where basically we have to follow. So we, what we want to do is we, we get our lasers reclassified and that's what, the, um, and that, that's what came out of this meeting was now the DOD are, are following not this predictive avoidance, this satellites are protected at all cost, but a probabilistic risk assessment, which is saying, what are the chances of actually a laser impacting a satellite? What are the chances of that impact causing any damage to that satellite? Okay, so it's a full risk assessment, um, which is by far the better way of doing that. And we are following, and there's a, there's a, uh, a few a blurb here about what that means, but basically that's a good approach to take. And so we are basically following up on that right now between the National Science Foundation, the Air Force Research Lab, which is basically the Satellite Assessment Center, which is a branch of the, um, which is one of their branches, and where we can, hopefully we want to, and we don't see any reason why not, but nothing definite yet. We can change from category three to category one would be the best, which means we don't have to follow, which would put us in the same league as the Europeans. Or category two, where basically we're just saying, hey guys, you know, don't look, don't look at us because we're, 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 we're propagating lasers. You know, it might not be beneficial to you. That would be a good way of doing it. So you're currently in the process of setting that up. Time to wrap up. Hmm? Ten, 10 seconds. Uh, there you go, 10 seconds. So. Yeah, so, um, so that's basically a summary of the talk and summary of where we are at right now. So I will entertain questions. I think so, um, questions on Slack, I'm afraid. I think there's no time, so. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. <laughs>